welcome home when he got here. And it's like he just got out. Can you imagine serving 30 years in a prison? No cell phones, like brand new. Electronics, brand new. Like lots of things you gotta learn about to be back in this world. <laughs> so like, I can't even imagine, I can only empathize because I've never been in that position. So all I'd like to do is say, wow, like we got 2.4 million of our brothers and sisters sitting behind bar still. We still have a long way to go. Legalization freedom is coming if we want it. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm 21st New York Harvest Festival welcome to Tim Tyler. Hello everybody. Uh, my name is Timothy Leonard Tyler. Um, you know, I, I might uh, shed a couple tears maybe in front of you. I'm not sure yet as far as speaking goes. Uh, this is probably the first time speaking to a decent number of people, but I feel like I was called to do some speaking. I, I was arrested in um, August 3rd, 1992, and um, I mentioned rats, but I'd rather not go in that direction, but somebody set me up in Florida, and, and I, he had been setting me up and had a lot of audio tapes against me. And, um, I had a lot of friends on tour. I, I came from, I'm a deadhead. I, I was I'm a, actually on my way to a Jerry Garcia band concert in Universal Amphitheater in um, Los Angeles. And I was on the side of the road, long story, but I had mailed some stuff to Florida and this guy set it up. And I mailed it to the business. And the, when it got delivered to the business, the guy who I mailed it to, who I trusted and knew since I was a kid, he cooperated on the spot and called my father and said, hey, I have an envelope for your friend. So my father went down there and um, he threw it in the car and he walked around my father in the business, you know, trying to get him to say one word that could incriminate him. And he was like, well, I'm just helping out a friend. Well, that ended up getting my father a 10-year sentence. And my father ended up dying in... Um, prison, in federal prison in 2001, April 17th, and uh, first of all, when I was, I, they arrested me, and they brought me to Florida, actually, I was arrested, and they put me on a jet by myself, I left from a hospital, don't even know how I got in there, I had an IV in my arm and a catheter in me, and put me on, in a, the marshals from Florida came, picked me up, took this stuff out of me, put me in a um, wheelchair, wheeled me down to the to a van and brought me to the airport and put me in a jet by myself with five marshals. I'm like, I just sold some LSD. So I get down and I consider it a sacrament, by the way, and still do it and, and always have it. And it's in my PSI. However, I get down, I get down there and uh, I have no bond. No, no, he's looking at who knows how much time, no bond. So I call people and I let everybody know, listen, I'm hit, I'm, I'm hit, for real. I'm, I know what, what time it is. I'm not going to trial. I'm, I, I believe it's a sacrament and I don't want to put any strain, stress on Jerry and anybody else associated, whatever the case may be. I didn't want to put stress on anybody. So I said, so I, I told my father, don't worry about it. I mean, I listened to my father in some aspects and some I didn't. But I, I pled guilty, thinking that he's, Jerry Garcia did an interview, he believed in, in uh, 2012, December 21, 2012, as a shift of consciousness, perhaps. And one actually came because they legalized weed one month before that, so in, in two states, if, if you remember. But I looked forward, I knew that I was going to be in prison from that date, at least until 2012, no matter what. But I also believed in Terrapin Station being a real place. You know, I'm not gonna get into that right now, but it's it's something that I believe, still believe. It's possible, great possibilities still, you know, according to the words, Jerry's supposed to come back, but that's getting a little bit off subject, maybe, maybe not. So, I believe that I was gonna be in jail until that date. And so I just 
adapted to my environment. I played handball every day. I befriended people that, you know, I, I didn't really, I didn't make enemies. I didn't, you know, I'm a nonviolent deadhead. You know, I, I love the Grateful Dead band. The people, I love them, and I, and I, and I noticed that, um, like they love you back. You know? Yeah. Like, uh, and the love never, it never went away. It's still here, man. So, oh, uh, this is a little deep for me because I, I was given a clemency. I, I, I was given two life sentences, put it like this, and I lived, and I had wardens and I had lieutenants, I'm like, what the hell is this guy doing in here? You know what I mean? I was believing that we were like saving the earth or, or raising consciousness on the planet. So, and they would, they would look at me, they don't even know, they're like, what is, man, he's got life or what, LSD, and you got pedophiles running here, doing five or ten years or whatever the case, whatever they're doing. And... I had literally lieutenants and wardens were celebrating when they when I ended up getting it, a clemency, and he gave me a two-year release date. My two my two-year release date was August 30, 2018. Oh. And um, don't it wasn't just that a simple to get a clemency. Um, families against mandatory minimums they. They took a liking to meet Julie Stewart back in the day, 20 years ago. She's been putting me my name through all over the place. Um, ACLU, they put mine and like five other people's uh, pictures and put them in all the magazines. And CNN, they did an interview with my sister, and my sister's been there nonstop. You know, and, I've, and I should talk about like your family. Like I'm in prison. I'm living in prison. I'm the one in prison, but my sister and my mom feel like they're in prison. I mean, they were actually literally depressed for 26 years, you know. Um, so, you know, it's more than just you being in prison. It's your families, this and that. It's also nobody higher than me or lower than me, for that matter, was implicated in anything. It stopped with me. Whoever I was before my friends were, a lot of them, some of them are still alive. A lot of them are still alive. And then come to find out, this, this is all my friends. And 423,000 people on change.org, which is another one, have this change.org shirt on because Jonathan Perry at change.org, you know, he, he, he said some things like, he just... He just withdrew from change.org like two days ago. And, and he said something, you know, he met me at Terrapin Crossroads, right? Right when I got out, I went to Terrapin Crossroads. And um, he asked, what does it mean to me? You know, what does it mean to me? What, what have I done for you? Well, without him and, and everybody else, all of you, all the people in this country, 423,000 people on change.org signed a petition for me. Without all those people together, without the Grateful Dead reuniting to get President Obama elected, without all types of, without Can Do Clemency Foundation where, or the Catholic Social Services, Catholic um, University in Washington, D.C. decided to do my petition for clemency, without all of those people without head count and relics magazine without everybody all this together i wouldn't be here right now i wouldn't be free right now to even speak in front of anybody so i looked at it like okay would i like to speak sure i i, I want to help the next person like there's people in weed in prison doing life for weed like i i was in prison for 20 years with a friend of mine named billy Deco. He, he got a clemency, luckily, but for weed. He was in there for weed, doing life, along with me. You know, and, and, and the other thing is, like, I'm vegan, and I, I, and I actually did that in prison. You know, I didn't, wow. I didn't, I didn't, wow. I didn't change. Wow. I was vegan before I went in, and I stayed it. 
I might have eaten something that might have contained milk or whatever that they served that I had no idea. But other than mine and stuff, so there was days and times when I would be literally starving in prison. But I'm so thankful to be given a second chance that whatever obstacle I need to do, I feel like what just me being alive to make it out of there to be able to explain you know it's very very difficult to eat healthy in prison oh, very di and, and you know and I used to say well look I was sentenced to never be in society again I'm in prison why can't I get access to like organic food or something healthy where I can live because eventually you guys are going to wake up this planet and this country and you're going to be like whoa what what it, how much did we spend to keep this kid in prison and what it was he here for exactly he said LSD is a sacrament in my PSI LSD is a sacrament okay it says sacred substance like marijuana like the seeds are the best thing you can eat as far as protein goes you can make the best housing uh, paper clothes out of hemp and marijuana I mean I'm totally down with marijuana I, I even the guy that set me up I even sold him like a pound or two or whatever it's in my PSI too, but they didn't care about that. They were like conspiracy to distribute LSD. Oh yeah, we we get life sentences, two life sentences. And uh, the interesting thing is, another reason I, I would not be able to be here tonight would be if I was on paper or probation or something, because technically they should have handed me 10 years supervised release when I was sentenced, but the judge was so happy to hand me them life sentences that he didn't suspect that I could get out someday. Which means if you don't, if you're not sentenced to it, then you have no paper, no probation in the federal level. So, Ob Mr. President Obama ended up giving me a clemency with a two-year release date. Most likely, I did. He, it's like I did it two years up front that it would have probably had to do on supervised release. So now I'm free to actually go somewhere, speak, or perhaps some words that I say might, or just myself. I feel like um, I was put in this position, so I need to embrace it and try to, you know, and it's interesting because it's it's locked up. I feel like there's a lot of people behind me. Um, like, for example, I went to Headcount yesterday just to, like, thank them, and it's in the headquarters where Relics Magazine is, and I wasn't going to mention this, but Headcount put it on their page, and it was shared so many times, I'm like, okay, I, I'll, I guess I'll mention this, but... While I'm in there telling a story about music, um, from 1992 to 2012, for 20 calendar years, I could not listen to Grateful Dead music. And except if I would call my sister on the telephone for like $3.21 a call, and you only get a certain amount of calls per month. And she would play me days between over the telephone. So I was telling this story to. Uh, Andy Bernstein at Headcount yesterday, and he said, um, "Would you mind? Would you please repeat that story to Bob Weir?" And uh, I re and I repeated this story to Bob Weir yesterday over the phone, and he's like, "I said, Bob, uh, I'm a little nervous right now. This is pretty pretty deep for me. You know what I mean? I mean, I walked by him before. It's just deep. I'm I had a focus of 26 years." In the last two years, I didn't have a release date until two years ago. I lived with life never, supposedly never going to go home. So I had this comprehension of, I'm in this prison, so I'm going to do the best. I'm going to play handball all day. I'm going to, you know, create, um, try to live, try to be healthy, and go home. And for the last two years, I had a release date. And so I had all these dreams during this release date. And... So I'm, uh, here I am speaking to Bob Weir at head count yesterday, you know, and I was just going to keep that in my, my mind to myself. But they shared it. And for them to share it, it's, I'm sure it's like getting shared and shared and shared. And I, and I have to embrace that. I, I'm thankful. He's like, I want to talk to you. I want to meet you. And I'm like, <laughs> I said, well, maybe I shouldn't have said this. I said, you know what? I always had this um, wish to play Althea. <laughs> Well, I guess it's close enough. Maybe I'm talking too long right here, right now. No. Althea.
Um, so let's see. Uh, yeah, I just smoked a joint live. Well, it's not live, but it could be live. You never know. Um, let's see. I, <laughs> I, um, you know, I walked out of prison, right, and I had a, I had a cousin, and um, up and all the way up every day, I never even, I, I received the clemency, you know, actually, actually I should talk about that real quick, because we have what we call movements in prison, you can only move every, every half hour for 10 minutes, you can walk out somewhere and they lock all the doors and you're not supposed to move anywhere. And um, I'm waiting on a clemency. And I mean, I'm, a whole bunch of people are waiting on it. It's like a lottery, winning a lottery. Well, it just so happens one day, they came to my room and they said, go right now to R&D. And, so, and it's not even a move. And they opened a door and I just walked out like, like uh, wow, they're letting me walk. So I walked by this guy, he didn't say nothing to me. So it's like they already knew what was happening. And I walked in this area. And then they sent two other people from another part of the prison, and we're all three in this room. They locked us in this room. So I'm asking them, are you guys looking for a clemency? And did you put in a petition? And they're like, yeah. I said, oh my God, this could be something serious. So they, the one guy walked, he went first. They called him, and they put him on a phone with Washington, D.C. And he came back and gave a thumbs up. I was like, I can't even believe this. So they called me next, and I walked in there, and, there, and they put me on a speaker phone. And this was an assistant warden that put me on a speaker room phone. And he says, you know, Tim, I have some news for you that the pardon attorney turned in your clemency petition to the President Obama, and he ruled in your favor, and, he's, and you're going to go home. And, and I had... I, I couldn't, I could barely hold it together, and there was an A.W. there, a female, and she was, she looked like she wanted to hug me, you know, but it was like, I didn't cross that line, but she really, it was like, she could, it was this energy, you know, and, and, um, I, I couldn't believe it, and, it, and he gave me a two-year date, so a two-year release date, so then I went back and I called my sister, or I tried to, and I couldn't catch her, so I ended up calling my mother, and, what I did was, my I told my mother, and it, at first, in it, I got a clump. She go what? And I felt this energy lift out of my mom, like she'd been depressed all these years, and this energy just came right out of her, like, boom. And I could feel it through the phone. It was so deep. And I and I told, I called my sister right later on, and I finally caught her, and she already had, of course, heard I got the clemency. But I told her, and I, the, and I was able to tell her the story about my mom you know this energy leaving her and it so happens that like NBC was at her house recording that conversation of me talking to her about this you know and it was, and I just saw that because I to be honest I very rarely I don't know hardly anything on television I don't pay attention to any TV I don't know a, any news I can't tell you a lot of things I focus only on raising my conscious raising my energy raising my vibration and trying to explain different comprehensions and bring empathy back to the planet because you know what I walked out of I walked out of here I got this feeling I can't describe but I walked into a store they brought me to this little tiny store where they issue bus tickets and this West Brewer is a guy he worked for CNN and he decided to take the bus with me from Georgia, where I was walked out of Jessup, Georgia, all the way to Las Vegas, Nevada, and my cousin also, he came from Connecticut, and he, and he went down there because the Grateful Dead was playing the following day, and I had three days to get to Cali to get to the Las Vegas. Well, the, the, the I mean, Dead and Company was playing, I should say, and they know me. Although I'm, I'm a little more responsible than that, but there would be a part of me that would have went right to the show. And, 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 and actually come to find out I could have went there and still made it to, to the place on time but nevertheless he, they took a bus with me and he interviewed me for two and a half days on a bus, Wes Brewer did 
and uh, now I think he works for NBC. And so he was supposed to be here tonight, but they called him to work like three hours ago, four hours ago. Um, but anyways, he's working on this documentary, like a two-hour documentary down the line that's going to be touching even to me because he t I walked out of prison and everything I did for the first time organically was recorded. Like, he took me to a, a beach it's in uh, Savannah, Georgia. This beach, I mean, I'm walking out of prison. An hour later, he, I got off the bus. He took us in a rented car to this beach. And I mean, I'm seeing this GPS thing he's got on the car, like... It's got directions on where we're going. I'm like, what is, un what is going on? Look at what's happening. And we get we get to this beach. I mean, I just like, see, as soon as I seen this, I touched the sand, I was like, I just broke down. I just kneeled on the ground and like, thank you. Right on, kid. I was just, and then I went, and, he, and then I went to the ocean and recorded that. And then, you know, there's a song, "The Days Between," that is real, real dear to me. I know it, it's dear to everybody else from the day Jerry was born to the day he died. I understand that's the days between. But I, I envisioned in 2004. I, I let's say I had a vision. I was able, I was invited to a Native American sweat lodge. I fasted for a week. And some significant things happened there. And I actually wrote it in a book, but I haven't put it out yet. I have to read, change a couple things at the end. But I was shown um, this future, perhaps. This is 2004, remember. 2004, I'm in prison, I don't pay attention to the news. And I, I saw this like um, a stadium, let's say. And the guy that gave, ended up giving me a clemency now, who I've never heard of or knew of back in 2004, but I wrote it and described him. Him, the, Hil Hillary Clinton and Bill Clinton were at this stage. It's a global stage. And I'm pretty sure that the Grateful Dead reunited for this, but I didn't see that part yet. I only seen them and I seen this black guy who happened to be Obama, but I didn't know, I just described him. And I walked on that stage and shook his hand, her hand, and his, and Bill Clinton's hand. And that's why when Bill Clinton had a stroke or a heart attack, I was thinking to myself, he can't die because that stage has yet to become. And not only that, but I also saw that everybody had the chance to see that stage live. Everybody. And that was 2004. And keep in mind, I have not seen these phones until uh, May 29th. My mother handed me a phone. I, I was like, where's the button? You know what I mean? Uh, and then she, she turned it. You know, I, was, I, I called my sister with it. You know, and, and the first time I used one of these phones. And then I couldn't believe the stuff these phones are doing now. I don't know. Phones, computers, everything. It's like... It's, it's interesting because I, I have this comprehension of them. I just don't... It's amazing. Like, it, I feel like I was in a time warp. Um, I also have this feeling of, of like an animal. Like, let's say I, I heard a story one time of a cow. And the cow escaped from being killed. And that cow was like... Since he escaped, he, it was like he was pardoned or whatever. And he... And he got to live like a normal, a, a nice life after that. Sort of like the chick, uh, the turkeys that the presidents, you know, they were going to be killed, but now they're left. And that's what I feel like. Like I was already discarded, left, and here I am, here right now, free. And I like the last, last speaker, the weed man, what he was talking about. Um, about if you were to smoke some weed right now, and well, actually I think marijuana is going to be legal very soon also nationwide. I, I feel that. Not only do I feel that, it makes no sense. It's got, it, I mean, if some people are, are Christians, let's say. There's there's different, like I was into a little magic or whatever. And, but even in Christians where they use the Bible, and if you want to get thankful, it's a green plant that produces seeds that it is of God and it's good. And it, 
I mean, I, I'm not so much of a preacher as that extent, but for people that are saying it should be legal and calling themselves Christians, I think that's a little bit um, hypocritic. And, you know, that's, what I, that's just a little personal feeling that I have. Um, but I feel that it's going to be legal in our time. And not only that, I feel like the consciousness has raised a little bit ever since I've been gone. For the simple fact, like, there's vegan restaurants. Like, real vegan organic food, like, that's healing you, benefits you for your body to live, you know? And um, one other thing that I, I would like to say is something that's minor concerning health. Because I keep seeing canola oil. People don't even know what canola oil is. It's... It was made from a rapeseed plant, and it's highly damaging to your heart muscle. So if, you, if someone has canola oil on it, quit it right now, today. Quit canola oil. And look at the company. Watch this. You, you know, quit canola oil and look at, and watch what happens today. All the canola oil stuff with it, with it, you know, there's this conscious, I see this conscious, like the earth as a shift of consciousness and that, that's, coming, that's coming fairly quickly. And I felt like that's why I just traveled to California, to Colorado, to Maine, and where I actually moved to Maine already. Uh, and I see, I see this a, a global shift of consciousness coming. The one that Jerry described in 2012 that he got from Terrence McKenna. This is what gave me it, what, what kept me alive for all the way up until 2012. But then when I seen the Grateful Dead reunite to get Obama elected, I was like, oh my God, I better start really getting in shape and getting ready because I'm going to have a chance to go home because if the Grateful Dead reunite for somebody, then they're, if there was a deadhead in prison, there was three of us that I knew that were doing life for LSD that were deadheads. There's one more that I know right now named Leonard Picard. He's my friend. And, and Leonard Picard... Leonard Picard wrote a book called The Rose of Paracelsus on secrets and sacraments. Not only that, he did six years back in the day and he went home and he went to Harvard and graduated Harvard after doing prison time. This man is so intelligent. He's, he's, he's like, okay, here I am. But he is, he's in there for LSD. He was trying to save, he was, him, okay, I'll, I don't know, here's what I, here's how I view him. They were trying to change the consciousness of the planet, raise the consciousness level, right? And I feel like that is a, a sacred thing to do. You know what I mean? Just like I consider LSD, LSD the sacrament. Well, that book he has, I'll tell you, man, that book brought me on, on a psychedelic, reading it in prison and all the highs and lows, it was a psychedelic experience reading that book. And uh, he wrote, like, me and my sister in there, toward, I think at the very end, and, uh, and the other LSD prisons, because Rob Riley got out, but, Rob Riley got out, but not Rudd Walker. There was another guy named Rudd Walker in prison, and my sister helped him get, like, 100,000 seniors or, or whatever, and change.org, and all these people sharing, and, and he ended up dying in prison of a heart attack right before he was going to get a clemency, because I'm pretty sure that... Obama's giving all three of us a clemency. So he actually died in prison for LSD. You know, I feel real bad about that. And he wrote, put him in the back. Um, I went in a big, big circle here tonight talk, speaking. I just want to say that um, I, I thank you all for uh, me, allowing me to be here. It's our world if we want it. Yeah. This war is over if we want it. This war is over if we want it. Vote. We, we are the change we've been looking for. Vote. I'm not going to ramble on. we got music to play. i got things to do. I'd like to thank each and every one of you for being here today. For coming Vote. out. For getting off your couch. Yeah. Vote. For being here in the woods with us.
Thank you, Tim. Thank you, everybody. We love you, Rob Thank Robinson. You in the pile is a band you're not going to want to miss. It's their first, first conviction here at the New York Arms yeah. Fest. Their first time offenders. And then we'll be coming right up. Dogs in a pile. Dogs in a pile.